Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Simeon Morrow, Executive Communications Coaching, and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please turn off your camera and microphone and or go to the Facebook live video feed, the link to which I will now place in the chat room. For a better experience, please turn off your microphone and set your video to gallery view. Tonight, our featured guest is Dr. Julie Ford, a choir conductor, associate professor and music program director of the Performing Arts Department of St. Mary's College of California. Joining Julie is her colleague, Sharon Lee Kim, a pianist and adjunct associate professor of performing arts. Also joining us tonight is Dr. Lino Rivera, professor of music at St. Mary's College of California. Welcome, Julie. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Julie, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work? Absolutely. Well, um, I am a classically trained musician, primarily in terms of my academic training, um, conducting early music enthusiast. Uh, went off to Eastman wanting to do orchestra and learn all about performance practice super enthusiastic about Bach and Renaissance, all these things. Um, but I also always had this other part of my life, which was jazz. And as I was traveling through my studies, my, um, I really struggled to be able to do both. Um, everything's designed for those to be separate in terms of like class schedules, ensembles meet at the same time, different faculty, um, so it really extended my, you know, years of being in college, frankly, because I, I just didn't want to give up that idea. And um, I've always been very interested in performance practices. And that includes jazz, you know, how is this music performed? What's the history? And then how do I bring it in an authentic way? So that's always been um, my passion. And uh, I have before come, I came to St. Mary's about 10 years ago, but before that, um, I worked at it. I got hired by a church because they wanted to di diversify. They didn't want just traditional. So I spent about 10 years working with all these community uh, choirs, hiring orchestras, hiring jazz combos, um, training up children's choirs and adult choirs, and trying to mix all these genres up in one church service or in one concert. Um, I reached out to Temple Isaiah wanting to do interfaith music. So I've always um, had this uh, passion for integrating music, integrating different communities. And I mean, it is diversifying, it is inclusion, but it, it was kind of organic as an artist where I came to that point. And Julie, can you tell us uh, about how you got interested in jazz and uh, into choir conducting or classical music in the first place? You said that you went to 
Eastman School of Music, looking to learn uh, classical music, right. said orchestra music. How 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 is it that you you developed such um, such tastes for all these different kinds of music? I guess that's uh, maybe more common today, less well, so uh, before in the conservatory. Yeah, you know. Yes, I, this is. I, I think that's kind of an interesting question. You know, I started learning piano in preschool, and then I wanted to continue after you know, it was like a piano preschool class, and I wanted to continue lessons. So I started really young, and the thing was that I had a teacher who was a literal hippie. I mean, a hippie. Thank God I did because. She kept me studying piano all the way until I was 16 or 17 years old. And the only way I stayed in, I'm convinced, is because she was so, she was so outside the box. So I'd show up for my lesson and she'd say, let's get to that Mozart sonata. And I'd, I'd play it. And then she'd say, I don't really think it sounds any better than last week. What have you been doing? Because your mom says that you're at the piano all the time. And I said, well, I figured out how to play this Beatles tune. And she said, well, let me hear it. So I'd play things that I learned by ear um, or whatever, you know, whatever music was in the air. It was like Earth, Wind and Fire. My parents, you know, so asking how, is it, how I became so diversified. My parents loved classical music, but they loved every kind of music. And there was always music playing in the house. And I would try to play it by ear. And so thank goodness my teacher, she would assign me the same darn Mozart assignment for a month until I'd get my butt in order. Not that I didn't love the Mozart, but can I be honest? I wanted to play Mozart my way. I, I mean, I just, and um, she would let me do that, but then she'd also let me you know, do it on the page, so to speak. So I think obviously that kept me really enthusiastically involved in music and um, kept me you know, on the path. So I think that imprinted me. When I went to college, um, I thought, I don't wanna be a music major. I don't want to have because like, to me, music major meant that I was going to be a concert pianist like our wonderful colleague, uh, Dr. Lena Rivera and also Sharon Lee Kim. And as brilliant as they are, I'm not made like them. I, I, I don't have their personality or whatever it is, their grit, their incredible stay to it kind of technical discipline. I just didn't enjoy being in a practice room for hours doing that. So I thought, no way, not a music major. And then I had a teacher who taught classical and jazz wires. And I met her and she changed my life. Um, first of all, I had no idea how to sing because I was a pianist. And she said, and guess where I had my vocal success immediately? I had success in the jazz choir because there was not a prejudice about how my voice had to sound. I could be in tune and phrase and just be musical. I didn't have to sound like a classical singer. So I think that also very much imprinted me, you know, that I, um, in fact, I had a voice teacher in college who said, guess what, Julie, you have so many vocal problems. Just be a music history major. If you're gonna major in music, do music history because it's gonna take you forever to fix your voice. So, but I wasn't getting any of that feedback in jazz. I was getting nothing but support because I had the musicianship to improvise and I had that. So I think that's what kind of all of that stuff imprinted me. And um, in college, uh, yeah, I just had to create my own path, which meant a lot longer, many more years as an undergrad than uh, thank goodness back then education wasn't as expensive as it is now. And Eastman, forget it. At Eastman, there was no jazz. I mean, there is fantastic jazz, but it's a separate we don't even, you don't even see them in the hallway. It's like separate worlds. Wow. So before we get into uh, then your work, uh, I guess, becoming a, a doctor of music and then bringing all of this uh, scholarship to St. Mary's College of California, let's check out the choir again. Now they're singing Renaissance music. Yeah, um, this, so that became really my passion. And, you know, once I really discovered how rich Renaissance music is, but also how improvisational it is. So you can see, so that was a passion, the, the formal education part. Yes, please do share. Here we go. Oh, oh, oh. 
Fantastic. So I'd like to uh, welcome Miss Sharon Lee. Hi, Sharon. Hi there. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work at St. Mary's College sure. of California? Thank you for having me. Um, I'm a professional pianist and a music professor at St. Mary's College, where I teach and have taught classes like music history, theory, chamber music, piano, and of course, choir. I am the vocal coach and pianist of the voice students, which keeps me on my toes because the students bring a wide variety of music. I coach the singers in the standard classical vocal literature, like operatic arias, leader, and chanson, uh, but also pop songs, Disney songs, jazz, rock, and the list goes on. Definitely keeps me on my toes and it's always fun. I am also the assistant director of the Chamber of Singers and the Glee Club. And I have to say, it's just such a pleasure working with Julie because she's not only my boss and colleague, but she's a very good friend and I feel so lucky. Um, besides teaching at the college, I teach privately and I perform. I have a private piano studio and I also perform throughout the year, mostly on weekends with professional musicians from the Bay Area and throughout the nation as well. It is my passion to perform. Um, I have degrees from UC Berkeley with a focus in solo piano and composition and at the New England Conservatory where I found my joy in collaborative, uh, collaborative piano. I specialized in chamber music and vocal accompanying. Um, so with that said, I'm besides teaching at St. Mary's, I am a freelance pianist gigging with musicians from um, the San Francisco Symphony, the opera, ballet, and other groups as well. Um, I'm the pianist of Ensemble Ari, a chamber music ensemble that performs an eclectic mix of standard classical chamber repertoire, solo repertoire, and new works as well. So that's a nice variety of chamber music. And going back to St. Mary's as the assistant director there, um, my roles include leading sectional, stage managing, singing with the students, adding choreography sometimes, uh, leading team building activities, and of course, provide piano accompaniment, but not always at the piano. Sometimes you'll see, for example, in the next video, I am providing accompaniment behind the djembe. So I hope you enjoy the next um, tune. It's Shosholoza. Thank <laughs> you. 
Fantastic. So Sharon, that was your choreography. Also, you were on the djembe? Actually, the choreography was a collaboration of um, asking the students feedback. Our students are so creative. They have a lot of great ideas. We um, asked them to give some feedback and then I mean, Julie and I will kind of tone it down or ask them to do more. So it's, it's definitely a collaborative work between the students and instructors. Well, seeing them dance and sing like that so well, it really makes the audience envious. You really want to be up there yourself. So um, Julie, so tell us a little bit about how you got into conducting. You told us how you were, went between singing, piano, different genres. Then uh, how is it that you got interested in conducting? What were, what were your early, what was your early career like? Well, you know, um, I think I mentioned I started college not a music major. I wanted to do pre-law. And um, honestly, the music faculty kind of teamed up and bent my arm and said, what are you thinking? You know, like they, um, they could see that I, my enthusiasm for music and my sense of discipline, obviously all those years of piano situated me so well to excel in theory and piano skills and things like that. Um, so, but I kept saying, I don't wanna be a concert pianist. Sorry, my beautiful colleagues, I'm glad you are, but I didn't wanna do that. So I had no idea what, what and then I said, I certainly don't wanna teach. Heck, I don't wanna teach, that sounds awful. <laughs> and then, then um, my choir director who was so, uh, such a profound musician, the one who did jazz and classical, all of a sudden I realized uh, I could see myself in her. I thought, she kept saying, you can conduct, you can be a conductor. And I never thought about that. So pretty early, I'd say like at the end of my freshman year of college, I was like, okay, I'm switching to music and I think I wanna be a choral director and I better learn how to sing because that's gonna be a thing I need to know. Um, and I better find a voice teacher I had the voice teacher I had, the one that told me I had so many problems, and I better quit her and find someone who can help me. Um, so that's what changed me. And she was amazing um, because she let me conduct really young. I mean, maybe my sophomore year, she just got me up there conducting rehearsals, conducting physically in concerts. Um, and then she took me in tow all up and down the state of California whenever she did festivals and she would put me on the spot and she kind of threw me in and, and helped me imagine that's what I could do. And Julie, so right from the, from the beginning, you had successes. It wasn't really anything hard that you had to overcome besides learning how to sing correctly after that bad experience with the teacher. But their conducting career actually went, it was smooth sailing. Well... In some ways, in some ways, yes, uh, in that um, I didn't really understand that this was something really big deal that I was doing. I, I, it just kind of organically happened. I think if I had had a moment to stop and really think about it too much, I did have a lot of stage fright, um, but somehow having your back to the audience, <laughs> it makes it a little less scary. Um, but, but then the reward was there. And also, um, I mean, I really do think because of all the non-classical music that I was singing and growing up with, I felt, I felt the music was physicalized for me. Since I was so immersed in the Beatles, Earth, Wind and Fire, Car who, the Carpenters, anyone, you name it, Stevie Wonder, I kind of grew up moving and dancing and conducting as an extension of that made sense. Um, she also started off, this is really maybe kind of, I've never heard anyone else say they experienced this. My teacher who was from the Philippines originally, uh, she taught me Tai Chi, tai chi um, moves first before I learned my conducting gesture. And what, what do Tai Chi movements consist of? What does that mean exactly? Of course, I didn't go deeper into the study yet. I still hope to in my life, but the basic principle is that nothing ever stops. Your body's in constant motion. So the, the, the parallel is that, you know, there's motions like this where you're doing even and um, beautiful, undisturbed, peaceful motions. So the idea that, you know, music, even through the rests, music shouldn't stop, right? 
We know that. Um, and so I think that that all kind of came together for me really to just the conducting became an extension of my musicality and this concept of motion and move music just all seemed to be blended together for me i think you know fantastic let's take a look at another video of the choir Fantastic. And may I say, uh, Julie, how brave your students are to get up there and sing with masks on in order to protect others. So, um, Julie, can you tell us when you're conducting that, when you're preparing that kind of music, how, how are you teaching your students? I could see that they're moving also while they're singing. I could see a little bit of Tai Chi in your movements. <laughs> um, you know what? I this I I have a saying that the students say back to me like a mantra that groove is not optional. <laughs> and of course, that really when we talk about groove, we usually use that term when we're talking about non classical music. It's more of a colloquial term for rhythm and blues or jazz or rock and that. But um, I don't approach it that way. I believe you need to be in the groove. And if you are totally stationary, then you your whole body is not engaged. It's just not. 
no musicians really find successful phrasing, breathing, humanity, if they're stiff. There's no instrument that I've ever seen where that ever works. So um, I do have to encourage them to move. The other reason is also, uh, you're asking about how do I teach it? Um, I, you know, we'll, we'll get to this in more detail later, but I base all of the pedagogy that, that I use on vocal science, um, which is how is our anatomy, our physiology creating these sounds? How can we study all the structures, figure out how to manipulate them to our liking, um, which in the whole body is the instrument. I mean, there's just no, there's a respiratory system, but then there's all these other vocal structures. And the way that your skeletal anchoring happens will really influence the sound. So to be anchored, we all know like our core engagement, right? That's, thank goodness, such an awareness now that we need to get our core strong. Really only way, way to engage your core is to keep moving. So I, I do do that. And I, I mean, within my gestures, this pedagogy includes gestural kinesthetic study. You know how our wonderful solfege has um, all of the gestures that go with the different do, re, mi, fa, so. So this physiology also has hand gestures to help them kinesthetically see something here that they have to feel internally. So in my conducting, I throw some of those in too. So if I do see them getting stiff, you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll give them some of those gestures like, hello, you're getting stiff. Like uh, you, you had a wonderful show on Simeon, Simeon uh, that I viewed about the excellent sheep. Uh, this idea that academia trains people to be excellent sheep, that's the opposite of what we can, we have to do for our students. They cannot be sheep. They are, I'm standing there waving in the air. I'm not doing anything. They are creating the sound. They cannot be sheep. They have to make it happen. And that's that whole body commitment. So everything, just a matter of what the style is. And Julie, um, tell, so about that, how has the reaction been from your other colleagues? Because that seems somewhat revolutionary. Uh, uh, Lino Rivera and I, we've spoken about that numerous times on this show about how uh, at St. Mary's College of California, it's a liber liberal arts college. So the real idea is really training the citizens of tomorrow and training them to think on their own and uh, make informed decisions on their own. In other words, to be, to be leaders. So, but in a choir, yeah, I, I'd imagine that many of your colleagues, they give the opposite training. They say, you have to fit in. You don't want to, we don't want to hear individual voices. We want to hear the whole group. So a, a, a kind of a military approach to it. You seem to have the completely opposite approach. Have you run into a lot of resistance or what has, have the reactions been from the students and from well, the other professors? Starting with just people in my field. Um, I, that's really, one of the reasons I get the choir out to do festivals and competitions is so that I'm constantly getting that sense of a check within my profession. Like, am I, does this seem to be connecting with my field? Am I, am I getting so out on a limb? And so I don't think so at all. Um, I think I get great feedback from my colleagues. I do, there is something really different than when you see my choir up against the other choirs. It's very different. And, and so I'll have directors come work with a choir and they will say to me, there's something different about your group. When I ask them a question, 15 hands go up. And this, so it's kind of mysterious. I'd say that's the reaction is there's acknowledgement. Um, it, and there's also a little bit of, you know, what the heck are you doing over there to make that happen? But then I also have to say there is some pushback too because I don't go for the classical tone on every piece. And that's very different in my field. Um, not, but you know what? I'm, we're, we're set up to meet the moment of today because things are breaking open right now, as you know. I mean, certainly in the United States, racial uh, reckoning is happening about what are we centering and calling quality. So we're, we're on the path already of trying global sounds, using our voice in global ways. So actually, I feel like all of this work that I think kind of made people scratch their head is now coming into focus. Um, and I think the students, well, 
did you notice in some of these videos, I just go sit down, right? Um, they never, they, they're, they love it. They love being in control and being in command and being empowered. And they love, I think they love the fact, well, I'm just reflecting back what they say to me. The, I, I, they say, you don't just say get soft, you say how to get soft with the physiology of the body. So I know how to do it. And then you say, what is the motivation for being soft? So I know how to embody it. So I feel like my greatest compliment is that I, they don't need me anymore. That's what I'm working. I'm hoping they graduate and they don't need me. I mean, I'm still like to be friends, but <laughs> they go out and do their own thing. And Julie, uh, just before we move on, because you will be giving a presentation about your research, also in that uh, episode we did with John, uh, Jonathan Zimmerman and B Bill Derosiewicz, they both talked about how, um, for example, Jonathan Zimmerman, he received the, you know, the best teacher award <laughs> prize. And he said that most of his, the other faculty would never want to have that. And that because he was a great teacher, in fact, that somehow uh, the prejudiced idea was that his research was meaningless or that he didn't do research. How do you see that? Uh, clearly, you're a popular teacher uh, and your students love what you're doing and you uh, have an extraordinary impact on their lives. What, what do you think about that uh, uh, as a researcher? Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting. We had a moment, you know, so I mentioned we go to competitions. We go to competitions every two years. We go to the World Choir Games. Um, and so you have a decision to make. Are you going to create music that will win the first prize? Because that's not what I do. Although I know how to do that. I know how to, I feel like I'm well-trained. I could do that if that was the goal. So I, we had a moment um, that involved the students. We were in Latvia and we had just qualified for the champ, what they call the champions um, category. We just qualified, but the people who qualified us was a panel of judges. They cautioned me. They said, we think you're ready for this, but we really think that all that movement is not going to be what is expected and it might be distraction. So they, so we were doing this, an African piece. And by the way, as that, that choreography is very informed by African dance. I know there's lots of kinds of pan-African dances, but in general, the bending of the torso and these kind of, and we actually traveled to South Africa. So we got some of those movement ideas from the source. But anyway, they were saying that they were cautioning me. We caution you. That's probably not gonna go over well. And the other thing is this piece that you played up front, the, the Sicchio Vorre Morire, the Monteverdi. They said, you're doing all these ornaments. You're doing all this tempo flexual, you know. There, I, we think you should tone that down. That is not the standard way. And if you really want to do well, and so I, we, we, Sharon, and you know, I went out. We went to the students, and I said, "Listen, that Sikio Vorebore is based on my research. I know my primary sources. I know its sound, but it's not the way it's done. Do are we here to win? If we, you look, I don't care. My ego can go out the door. What do we want? Do we want to get? Do we want to go in there and just do what the competition demands, or do we want to do?" what we believe in, I will tell you that you need to make that decision. I can't make that decision. And they all were like, screw that. We want to do what we do. Um, but I, it was because also they knew that it was based on research and scholarship and thoughtfulness. And do you know that that Sikyo Vore Morire that we did got the highest score of any of our pieces? And the result, did you win the competition? Uh, we won a gold medal, wow. so we got we got in the gold medal. It was one of those situations where if you everyone can get you know within a certain grade, and we got a gold medal. So uh, did we didn't get the best in category, you know, which is fine, you know. But so, th but there is a balancing act there that I feel like if I want to win people over to thinking differently, um, I don't want to go in with a wrecking ball and arrogance. I want to do it in an authentic way and then if people are ready to embrace that then then i'm doing my job so i i do i will say i've been denied 
multiple times to present at conventions. They don't know what the heck I'm talking about. This year, everything I submit for, I get accepted. So something has, if something has really is changing. How courageous. Let's take a look at uh, another video here. I believe this is a completely uh, different kind of music. If I sang out of tune, would you stand up and walk out with me? Lend me your ear, and I'll sing you a song. And I'll try not to sing out of key. Give me. Fantastic. So uh, Sharon, would you be able to tell us a little bit more uh, about how you met Julie and how Julie has influenced your work? Uh, you, like you said before, you were mainly a classical pianist and a collaborative pianist and a composer. Now um, you're playing the djembe, you're doing choreography. Oh, yes. We're always having a lot of fun at St. Mary's. Um, well, let's see. First time I met Julie was about 10 years ago when I was part of the hiring committee and Julie was hired by Lino, myself and another colleague. And there was something about her. I said, this is the person we need to hire. Anyways, fast forward a little bit. We had our first official meeting um, over some coffee and some um, lunch and it was love at first sight. <laughs> we, um, we, both grabbed our order to Diet Coke and asked for the hot sauce, Tabasco sauce. And both of us like our food spicy and we like our caffeine. So we hit it off right away and we've been great friends ever since. We think alike. We are always on the same page. We feed off of each other's ideas. Um, and she's got tons and tons of creative ideas. Sometimes so creative, I'm like, wait, what did you say? And then I have to chew on it for a little bit soak it in and then say yeah I, I actually think that's a really great idea we should do that um and I want to specify over COVID how creative she was um she was so so positive to the students and so creative and I mean both of us we were shocked at how are we going to teach choir how are we going to teach music classes on zoom classes this is ridiculous we can't hear anything back we're just singing to ourselves um, and rather than just lecturing and pounding out notes on the piano to help them learn their parts, we incorporated fun ways um, to get the students actively involved on the screens, um, motivated to learn their parts. Even sometimes, you know, they're sitting in these Zoom classes for science, for math, English. And sometimes I just say, get up, let's do some yoga or let's play some games or whatnot. And um, we incorporated fun ideas. We had act, have them in, involved, motivated to learn. Um, you'll see in this next video um, how we introduced them to some cultural literacy, EWF, one of my favorite groups, Earth, Wind and Fire. Um, we employed some pro musicians who were experts in funk style. And then the students, they had to do their own homework and find, use their own ideas, talk to their parents, 
go through their own closets and find outfits that fit the era. And um, I want to say that she always instructs and shares with a very positive attitude and um, positive energy that the students feed off of. Um, they get inspired. I get inspired. We inspire each other. It's, it's a win-win situation. And you'll see it on their faces in the next video. Fantastic. So, Julie, now I'd like to turn it over to you for your presentation about a choir conducting symposium. Yeah, I mean, I have to say it's been kind of delightful how our ebb and flow of conversation has gone. I feel like I've been able to kind of preface this presentation. I can really trim it down now because I feel like there's some context provided. But yeah, go ahead and should I go ahead and share my screen? And um, if you'll forgive me, everyone, I'm just going to fast forward through some of these slides because I feel like we've done the job to provide some of that context. Um, okay, if it can, is it seen okay? All right, so this is actually, um, we were able to already do some listening so, um, and you know who I am. So I guess probably a question that's out there is what does genre biased mean? I have searched and searched to describe what we're doing and I really can't come up with anything better um, because it is what it is. And what I am getting at is what, well, how do I make these repertoire choices? I'm not just choosing Earth, Wind & Fire because it's fun, it is but box fun too. So why am I choosing Earth, Wind and Fire? I'm choosing Earth, Wind and Fire because it, you the groove is not optional. You have to groove. Uh, almost everything is syncopated and it's so easy to rush if you don't understand inner pulses. So in other words, I'm choosing music that will teach our learning outcomes. What do I want these students to learn? I want them to really understand that rhythm is not just the big beats, it's all the inner pulses. And so, so that's a learning outcome. I also, there's a lot of major seven, minor seven, uh, flat five, a lot of jazz chords, a lot of extended chords, alt chords, and they need to challenge their ear to sing minor seconds and sing that crunchy harmony. So that's what those are, our, you know, our, our learning our intervals. Um, 
And then at the end of the day, um, I want to create something that's artistically beautiful. Um, I have a long arc in mind. I want these students to stay involved in music and I want them to be advocates for music. Uh, and I want them to experience it. I want them to have these experiences they look back on and they understand how their life was better, right? And I, lo I, I love that they know Monteverdi now. I love that they know Palestrina. I know that they I love they know Earth, Wind and Fire and they know Norwegian music and they know how they, I love the fact that they are experiencing beauty and seeing beauty in all forms. And then also fostering community. That's why I do choir and I'm not doing you know, other kinds of things with my musicianship. So then it becomes, well, how do you define community? Who's going to be in the room? Just people who read sheet music um, or just people that know how to dance or just people that can sing in a classical tone. Um, I can't have all of those things be prerequisites. So when it gets down to it, when you're in an ensemble, you have to have a good ear. You've got to have a good ear. You have to be able to hold harmony. So basically that's it. I just need to know they have, they can discern intervals, difficult intervals in a pattern. They can learn quickly and they can sing harmony. Also that they have some embodiment. If they come in stiff as a board, I really am not think they're, I don't think they're ready to do this kind of global learning. So how do you define the community? It just, you know, we have to not have barriers uh, and genres. If you're stuck in a genre, it can be a barrier. It's not as inclusive. And then non-genre bias means I'm gonna empower the students um, to explore and feel confident about, they can engage all these different styles. Uh, they're empowered, they, they understand. You figure out the primary sources, you, you analyze the music, you figure out what's powerful about it, and then you figure out how to apply your musicianship to it. Does that make sense? You know, so, so instead of saying, oh, I teach a chamber singers, I'm gonna go do chamber, singers music like my profession and I'll do some early music I'll do some uh, romantic music I'll do some 20 instead of kind of that as my starting point um, I have a different starting point but then I also have to say I have them for four years so surely in four years I can make sure they're exposed to Bach Beethoven Brahms all of these fantastic traditional composers but I also, they can learn about Stevie Wonder and the Beatles, and they can learn about uh, Beyonce and you know, more modern voices too and how they're making that music happen. So I'm gonna um, also mention that I draw upon their strengths. When Sharon and I, we do our auditions together, we take notes. We have them sing 60 seconds of any song that they like, you know, like on um, you know, American Idol or Sing Off or these shows come in and sing 60 seconds of anything. And that's when you see who they really are, what they, what's influenced them, what they like. And we take note, oh my gosh, this person can do vocal percussion or this person can really belt. We've got to think about including a belt song or this person's got gospel background. We, we can really use their ex life experience to inform a work that's make sure to schedule a, a, to program a gospel piece. So that's, that's really what non-genre bias means, I think. Um, and then, of course, you know, forgive me because some of these are this is this. I don't want to get too bogged down in this PowerPoint, but um, I think it might be helpful to walk away with a sense of, of these three things. What does it look like? And what do the students experience? And what are the benefits? Um, well, fortunately, because of the way we've designed today, you've seen a lot of what it looks like. Um, and I don't need to give you any context. I'm going right through all of that because we we did that already. What does a non-genre vice program look like? Well, basically we have a choir with two names. We, it, it's just the one choir. We meet at the same time and they learn everything. Um, the, we have the chamber singers, right? And that, and that means that we can sign up for festivals. And um, Simeon, I think in your introduction for this program, you said something like, when you think string quartet, you think you're gonna, you have an expectation, right? You're gonna see violin, two violins, viola and cello. Well, so, Chamber singers, people have an expectation within the music culture. Oh, that's going to be classical music and bel canto, Italian traditional classical singing. So we have that name. So if we need to be in that kind of fit in that kind of, play, of you know lane, we'll do it. We also call ourselves Glee, and who knows what Glee is? Nobody knows what Glee is. Glee, Glee can do anything. 
Um, but Glee is, you know, if they want like a, if there's a party on campus and they want a lot of fun, they don't call up and say, we want to hear the chamber singers. They call up and say, we want to hear Glee. Well, they don't know it's the same choir. <laughs> we just change our uniforms. That's it. Uh, and, you know, frankly, we, we pretty much mix it up no matter what. Um, Lino and Sharon might remember my very first semester, um, the choir got called to sing for the Christian Brothers, which is the, you know, we're Catholic college, liberal arts college, and the Christian Brothers are kind of the core of our history and our culture. And so these are basically Catholic uh, brothers, and um, they were having a dinner party, and I said, oh, we have got to do this Ave Maria by Victoria. We've got to do that. They're going to love it. It's in Latin. It's Renaissance. They might even have heard it before. And I remember the students going, are you crazy? This is gonna be in this dining hall. And I'm like, trust me, everybody loves beautiful music. It doesn't matter what century it's in. So of course we did that. We didn't open with it. We did some other things, but then I prefaced it. We sang that and there were tears all over the place. And so, I mean, it's, it's, um, it, it is managing expectations. Right, and then understanding the student, how, helping the students understand why we're doing this. Um, so I'm kind of mindful of time. I'm going to um, just let you know the one thing that does, we, we, if you want to go deep into some of these genres, um, you need an advanced uh, smaller group, uh, jazz in particular. So we do have a, an advanced ensemble, jazz singers, but guess what? They have to also be in the choir with two names. Does that make sense? So, and we sometimes, we, this year especially, we've taken the chamber singer, we've taken like the juniors and seniors and we've formed a, a separate set of work like Afton and Monteverdi and some of our beginning people, they, they did more. So I do have, within this model, I have ways to do beginning, intermediate, advanced, because you have to, right? But the way it's structured is they're all in choir. Who cares which choir? They start, they start matter, mattering less. Um, what they're called. Um, and then I'll just say that we have vocal science pedagogy, as I mentioned. So instead of teaching the traditional way, the Italian tradition that's imprinted all of Western music uh, uh, profession, uh, I, we teach, they learn how to use all these things and they use, they learn how to belt. In that, that last excerpt that you played, of let us, a little help for my friends with the microphone, you heard kind of yelling and belting. She's doing that in a very vocally healthy way. She knows exactly what she's doing. She could very well sing the next piece in an opera tone. And I can tell you, she can do it. Right, Sharon? She can totally do it because she know we're grounding it. So we're grounding it on that music, musical application of technique. And our teachers all teach the same way. We use something called Estel voice training, which is what um, vocal science is. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's probably, I'm just gonna assume that that is a, a good enough overview and uh, just be kind of mindful of that time and sort of leave it there. And then maybe, um, maybe be good to, to see it. I have a montage I created, which is um, side to side. It has all the pieces that we learned and it, it, you'll see in the slide, it says learning outcomes. Now you might not, the broader audience may not know what I mean by some of the jargon there, but um, still, I think it sets a good overview of, of, of how, this, how this happens. Do you, I think you have that, right? That, go ahead. Oh,
Fantastic. So let's see how we can stay in touch with Julie Ford. There it is, julieford.org. So Julie, we can reach out to you just by um, somewhere here on the website, email julie at julieford.org. Is that right? Yeah. I'm a whole organization. Wonderful. That's how complicated my life is. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. So thank you so very much to Dr. Julie Ford. And thank you very much to Sharon Lee Kim. Thank you for everybody for being here. And thanks for inviting me and us. So let's take a look at what's coming up next Wednesday. We have Juan Munoz. What? Is urban thinking? Since the Industrial Revolution, ever more citizens have eager, eagerly left behind self-sufficient rural lifestyles to become wage-earning employees. Among the trade-offs of that career switch is moving to crowded urban centers that are ill-prepared to deal with influxes of newcomers. It's a, a historical anomaly, but today, even in the midst of a global health pandemic, most of the world population lives in cities, and soaring urban real estate prices reflect their undiminished desirability. So the designs of urban planners have immense potential to improve human well-being, but it may be equally difficult to implement them. 
the architect Juan Munoz teaches a university level course called Urban Thinking. Come welcome Juan to our show and he will introduce urban thinking and give us a look at cities that all of us would want to call home. As always, all information about upcoming shows is available at www.simeonmoro.com. Again, that's next Wednesday, Juan Munoz, what is urban thinking? Once again, thank you so very much to Dr. Julie Ford, to Sharon Lee Kim, and to Professor Lino Rivera. Thank you very much to Agnieszka Rivole for her support of this show. Most of all, thanks to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile. From Vienna, Austria, from New London, New Hampshire, from the Bay Area, California, goodbye. See you next Wednesday.